okay? So please say hello to Marco. Right, hello everybody. Um, I am ecstatic to be speaking at an OWASP event. Uh, I used to live in Bristol and drive down for the evening to come to the chapter meetups here, and uh, OWASP has taught me a great deal over my life and career, so ecstatic to be here. Uh, hello, I am Andy. Uh, a bit of everything, uh, maybe a technical milliner by this stage, um, but I'm certainly a build fanatic and an advocate of continuous everything. Uh, I'm a founder at Control Plane, which is continuous delivery for container security, essentially. Um, and uh, I want to talk today about the Kubernetes attack surface ecosystem tooling that's available to deal with building pipelines to assert our state, and obviously, continuous security compliance and assertions. Why does this matter? Uh, because we need to know the state of our systems. Performance, veracity, load, why not security? Of course, I'm preaching to the choir here. <laughs> but if we don't know the state of our systems, we can never know if they've been compromised or are burning. Bless him. Uh, everything's fine when nothing bad is going on. But how do we harden a Kubernetes cluster to be resistant to an attacker that has already broken in? Everything public facing in Kubernetes is in a container. So. We want to make our containers as difficult to break out of or pivot from as possible. We also need to lock down our APIs, data stores, network security. So even a compromised system does not give up the keys and crowd jewels easily, giving us more time to detect the attack and shut it down. So um, we're going to go pretty deep. Uh, if you don't know Kubernetes already, then um, I hope this will be a, an enlightening experience. If you do, I hope that there is something um, for you as well. So, how secure is Kubernetes? Is it safe to run multi-tenanted in a public cloud, on a Raspberry Pi, locked in a safe in a box suspended above the Thames? Can we really run Google-style multi-tenanted infrastructure safely? And how do we make sure that what is safe today is also safe tomorrow? So, we will talk about common pones of Kubernetes and look at how it's been broken. Uh, how to harden, how to deal with our, our workloads, because there are two different networks in Kubernetes, one for the control plane and one for the containers. Harden soft multi-tenancy patterns and how to deal with this in very high compliance, super paranoid environments. And, uh, and finally, tying it all together with continuous security. So, back in the day, the kubelet was insecure. Security fails to keep up with the pace of feature delivery, as I'm sure we all know. Um, one thing to note here is that Kubernetes feels really insecure by default, which is not a good look. Um, but, of course, it has proliferated aggressively. It is uh, the most popular project in terms of new contributors, um, and it is an open source uh, success story, let's say and it's been deployed into every way you could possibly imagine. So, historically, there was an uh, ABAC model um, that would mount uh, a service account token into every pod. That service account had essentially root permission on the API server. So up until RBAC was shipped in 1.6, uh, then RCE in a pod meant that you could then root the cluster from one RCE. Uh, Workload security, this is um, about running setcomp in Kubernetes. Again, the setcomp extension, while available in Docker, was not uh, available uh, in, in the Kubernetes proxy layer, essentially, up until, uh, uh, I, I lose the version numbers. But anyway, this talk from Jesse Frizzell demonstrates how to defeat a dirty cow attack. Of course, containers are sharing the same kernel, so a kernel breakout is container to host very quickly. Uh, KubeCon saw another great talk from Brad Giesemann on the misconfigurations and insecurities in a cluster that he saw in vendor-supplied distributions. He worked with the vendors, uh, responsibly disclosed, then delivered this talk. Um, it really did a great deal of good for the ecosystem at large. Uh, Helm, which is a deployment configuration tool, had uh, an open gRPC interface until kind of recently. It didn't have TLS until a bit uh, less recently, uh, which meant, again, if you could make a gRPC call from an unprivileged container, 
in your cluster, you could spin up a privileged container, which, of course, breaks out of all namespaces and is essentially running um, a process on the host, and game over. Uh, so the unsecured dash dashboard from Tesla. Again, this dashboard had service account tokens that gave it elevated permissions to the API server, so a compromise of the dashboard leads to a compromise of a full routing of the cluster. Uh, in this case, they actually uh, did all sorts of things to get this dashboard on the public internet. Um, it, was a, it was an intentional but uh, sadly mistaken way of doing things. Uh, we've had a, a recent subpath um, volume mount symlink traversal issue. Um, of course, a mount point is, uh, is from the host. Mount points, process namespaces, memory, and process communication, they're all namespaces that you can share with the host, violating your security boundary. Um, as with privilege mode, it is foot gun central, and we will look at how to mitigate those sort of things. Uh, of course, Kubernetes is a very fast moving and uh, very broad and wide attack surface. And because it's under so much active development, of course, new code is somewhere for bugs to hide. This was probably latent in Kubernetes for a good couple of years. Um, and again, allowed container breakout, uh, well, host breakout via path traversal on a mounted volume. So, uh, ultimately, the first thing we have to do in a Kubernetes cluster is create a cluster CA, sign our root certs and uh, our leafs, and run mutual TLS across the control plane. Absolutely vital, <coughs> otherwise we are uh, leaking traffic that can lead to cluster compromise. Continuous security, again, I realize that uh, the choir is here and I'm preaching to them, but uh, of course we want to do these things because we know it's impossible to secure anything without automation on almost everything. And, uh, and continuous delivery and continuous security share uh, a beautifully uh, recursive, loopy future. Marvelous. So, let's look at the control plane. This is what Kubernetes looks like at a high level. We have, uh, in this case, this is a single master. You would always want to run this with high availability on the master nodes. Um, they, are, they are built to run in that manner. And importantly, what we have here is a lot of network intercommunication. Um, so the API server is the single point of truth. It is the only place that data should ever be accessed. Etcd should be firewalled, and we go into this, but firewalled and firewalled exclusively to the API server. If one is running COPS, then the Calico plugin that you are using talks directly to an unencrypted etcd. An unencrypted etcd is, uh, it's, again, um, root straight into the cluster, more or less. So there is now provision for keys here. We'll go into this as well. But, but ultimately, we have a single point of truth in the API server, and uh, we'll scale that API servers. Then we have the scheduler and controller manager, which do similar but slightly distinct jobs in terms of actually assigning a workload to a node versus assigning the horizontal scalability um, and, uh, and various other startup functions uh, that the control manager deals with. Then on the individual nodes themselves, we have the operating system, which uh, my preference would be something very lightweight, immutable, and locked down. Um, CoreOS was very good at this and was the kind of poster child of this revolution. Uh, there are now a few others that do it. Um, if you go on GKE, the image that you, uh, the operating system image that you run there, uh, it, it's beautiful. There's no exact permissions on a lot of things, and uh, it's, uh, you're constricted. So even if you break out onto the host, you still have a lot more work to do. There is also a minimal attack surface, of course, because these distributions do not come with package managers. The pattern is if you want to debug something, you pull down a container with those debug tools, and you run it that way. Uh, so, Lockdown OS, container runtime is typically Docker, although that is now changing with Red Hat's release of Cryo, container runtime interface plugin. There is Intel's Cata Containers, which integrates with uh, hardware VTX extensions to run virtualized, well, virtual machines as containers, and that is now full circle. Um, that obviously is probably uh, a, a trade off and balance between whether one requires uh, fast startup. Uh, or the extra guarantees that virtualization gives uh, that containers don't. So, um, yeah, of course. And then onto the kubelet, which is the agent for the API server, and then networking, which is a container network interface plugin. Um, the important thing to note here is that this is just a bunch of abstractions and indirection. Debugging stuff in here is a nightmare. Um, we will look at this further. So, 
Minimal viable security TLS everywhere, as we said. We now have provision to bootstrap TLS nodes. So historically, you would have to bake uh, your keys into your golden image that you use to horizontally scale your nodes. Now there is um, a TLS bootstrap that initiates trust using the public key of the certificate on the API server, uses that uh, for a temporary um, exemption, essentially, for the Hublet, passes the CSR, receives a certificate, mutual TLS and authentication, therefore, and, uh, and then we have joined a cluster from a golden image without baking secrets into the image. Super nice, um, turning up. That is what it looks like for those of you that care. Uh, I'll disseminate these slides afterwards because there's a lot of information in them. I won't go too deep into everything. RBAC, role-based access control, is the way to slice and dice your cluster. Permissions, uh, so instead of that nebulous cloud, one has this abstraction. Um, they're super difficult to audit. Uh, one of my pals has recently, um, I think this might be in twice there, one of my pals has recently uh, written a load of BATS tests for these, which I love. Let's see if it works. Yeah, so uh, you can literally use the Q-Control auth while uh, assuming um, a certain user and then assert the state of... Uh, ooh, ooh, bye. Oh, I would have lost my uh, presentation. Sorry. One moment. Let's go here. Um, yeah, and so that's really nice. That, again, leads towards continual assertions of identity and roles in the cluster. Um, and that is certainly the message that I'm uh, trying to convey today, that auditing RBAC is super difficult because uh, ideally the access, well, RBAC in a, a Kubernetes should be federated and we should push identity out to a third party system so that onboarding and offboarding is an organizational concern and not a snowflake concern for cluster A, B or C. That does mean that auditing these roles is difficult because all we have is a claim or a group coming in from uh, our federated um, identity. So making sure that these, group, these RBAC roles are locked down, super important and uh, an easy thing to get wrong without static analysis or testing on them. There are lots of ways to connect Kubernetes to an identity service. Uh, there are also many ways to uh, authenticate. Ultimately, you can just call out to your own binary and have that do whatever side channel authentication you require and then bring back your um, authentication into the cluster. Legacy authorization is old school. On GKE, you need to manually disable it. I hope this flag will become deprecated and default soon. GKE is the Google Kubernetes engine, which is their opinionated distribution. Uh, I, I love it personally. I think it's a fabulous tool. It's essentially a distributed system on a blocking API call, which is a, a CLI one-liner. Um, really quite magical. The port name, I mean, the flag name says it all, really. Um, they ship with insecure port because at one stage it was a way to monitor the um, applications at Bootstrap. Uh, they've worked around it now. This should always be set to zero. Otherwise, your 8080 port gives you read-only access to the API. As you can see there, it is locked down to localhost, which is a theoretical security boundary. But I mean, an unprivileged user can get on and uh, still have access to that loopback adapter. So that should be disabled. Otherwise, you can do things like this. This is leaking uh, secrets for a service account token. System anonymous. If we allow this, so unless we disable this, we leak our version information on the API server. The API server under a zero trust model is sitting publicly on some network with this mutual TLS authentication that I bang on about. Um, however, if you are just driving by and you have anonymous auth on, then you can scrape this from um, the, the 6443 ports that hang around the internet. This is the etcd model that is recommended. Um, etcd is the cluster state. When you submit a pod to the cluster, it is uh, validated in various different ways, mutated, and uh, finally validated again, and then persisted to etcd. Nothing else happens. The controller uh, and the scheduler then scan etcd for uh, configuration blocks, let's say, without certain annotations. And then as they schedule it onto nodes, then those annotations are re-added. So it's, it's a really nice pattern, actually, because it fully decouples everything. But etcd is absolutely <laughs> required to not only be available, but also secured, because everything, everything, everything is persisted to etcd. Super important. Get it as far away from all the rest of your infrastructure as possible. 
and of course, certificate rotation. Um, Istio is network security for the application tier. That now stands up its own CA, runs uh, a reverse proxy called Envoy um, from Matline at Lyft, which is uh, a modern C++ code base, they exist. And what that does is pull the new certificate every hour for this mutual authentication. It's actually backed by something called Spiffy, which is secure production infrastructure for everybody, which is workload identity. So by assigning an identity to a workload that we trust, we can encode that in a CSR, we can request a TLS certificate, and we can mutually encrypt our communication and do that with authentication. These things need rotating uh, in Kubernetes itself, however, because etcd was not encrypted by default, and in fact still is not. So even getting onto one of those etcd nodes um, and forking a core dump, you can get everything out and read it, or you can read it if you can get access to the client. The API server now has provision to do this, um, and uh, yes, there is more detail available. So, workloads. We know about containers. Bless him. Uh, so, containers form the basis of the Kubernetes security model. So, while these mechanisms are good for layering defense in depth and have mitigated a number of kernel vulnerabilities on top of AppSec, it only takes a single bad kernel bug, of which historically there have been a few, to bypass all these mechanisms and escape the container. Now, that is a generalization, of course, because layering will increase our resilience to various different forms of bug. Now, notably, there are still multiple resources that are not namespaced in the kernel. The system time, the kernel key ring, the kernel audit log, DNS resolution, devices, bits of proc. So we still leak things, and we still have Good enough security, as it's viewed by the kernel developers, um, but not if we bust out of these namespaces. So, the pod, the lowest addressable component in Kubernetes. And here's an insecure one with privileged enabled. This is um, running as root. It is privileged. We, uh, we have no set of comp here. Um, this is never something we should knowingly submit to a pod. Uh, of course, we wrote a tool, KubeSec, it's static analysis for Kubernetes resources, and it comes with a load of human readable uh, responses to why you're receiving these particular judgments uh, against the pod. And secondarily, uh, it's just an API call, and it will return you not only a risk, sc risk score, which is basically, if it's below zero, you probably shouldn't deploy this pod at all, and you should probably set that well above 15 or 20, because that requires a lot of positive security enhancing flags to be added to get you to that risk score, and then it will uh, try and vindicate its decisions and also give you some ad advisories on what you can do to increase your score. Uh, so, pod security policies are the API server's um, static analysis for pod YAML. If you have, in this case, host network, if you try and mount, if you try and bind to your host network adapter, so breaking out of your um, the, the network namespace, so if you try and share that with the host, then this pod security policy will deny it. As with sharing inter-process communication, the process namespace, this forces you to run as a non-root user. There is a dirty secret, which is the user namespace has never quite been finished. You may notice that Docker runs without the user namespace enabled by default. Kubernetes does the same. This is because discretionary access control and the fundament of the Linux security model is all based on the identity of a user. Making that work through multiple namespaces is difficult and nobody really wants to hang the uh, synthetic benchmark penalty on their layer of the stack. So the kernel doesn't want it, the block device drivers don't want it, the file system drivers don't want it. Um, and what uh, Lennart Pottering has suggested is that what we really need there is a shift file system. So the request goes to the file system, the ID is looked up in a map held in memory by the file system, and then mapped to the equivalent user on the host. Um, of course, this then becomes complex if you're bind mounted to multiple places at the same time, and we start to understand why no one's actually fixed this. So um, that's probably five years away. The long and short of this is that running as root inside a container is running as root on the host, because there are no user namespaces. That can have very serious implications uh, in some situations, and if you run an OpenShift cluster, the admission controller will prevent you from running anything as root, and it also rebinds your user to an arbitrary plus 30K uh, random ID, so that even multiple pods starting with, uh, multiple containers, sorry, starting simultaneously are given different user IDs, 
try and work around this problem slightly. Um, a lot of people bind, uh, sorry, a lot of people sign that to um, user 1000. That probably exists on your host, so you're just then inheriting the permissions of that user. Um, so strongly recommended to go high and uh, high and random. So resource linting, uh, Gareth, Oz, Gareth Rush Rose cube test um, is uh, it's kind of the other angle, it, it exposes Kubernetes resources and allows you to run a Python-esque dialect called Skylark, which is the, uh, uh, anyway, um, against your, your, uh, your Kubernetes resources. So deployments, um, as this brave individual is performing, well done. Uh, right, so uh, deployments contain a few extra things, um, notably, uh, these luminaries, um, if you don't recognize the names, are uh, core uh, original Kubernetes, either sort of founders or early engineers. It's all based on the Borg system from Google, which is aggressive multi-tenanting with containers. Borg moved to Omega, which was Borg v2. They learned things, they rolled the changes back, and they reintegrated them into Borg. And most notably, uh, labels. So, of course, these other things as well. But labels are, uh, are a secret source in Kubernetes. Now, it sounds super boring. They are just metadata annotations, like why would you give two hoots? Um, they are a fundamental security primitive in Kubernetes. Everything, everything is addressed by label selectors. A lot of things are addressed by label selectors that are used to reconcile a pod uh, or, or a resource's defined behavior with its targets. These are not validated, ever. Ever at all, full stop, triple golden bags, there's no returns. They are such a frequent point of debugging pain and security vulnerabilities. You make a typo and a label. Um, so by extension, static analysis on the actual resources that are submitted to the pod, absolutely paramount. Um, there are other patterns like Git ops, which is emerging, which is essentially committing your cluster state to a Git repository we actually layer multiple levels of controls on top of that um, uh, for source code safety and veracity. Four eyes on every pull request and static analysis on everything there. And then the cluster reaches out to that Git repo to pull its configuration back in so no one actually has write access to the cluster. And then it asserts its state and unifies the state with that uh, desired state in, uh, in the Git repo. That's a good place to check for labels going wrong. Services also use labels to address the pods behind them. And they're quite innocuous. There's not a lot going on there. They're essentially um, uh, just um, a, a virtual IP that will redirect traffic to where it needs to go. But the one benefit they have, we don't want to run as roots in our containers. If we run a web server, we're probably used to binding to 80 and 443. If you look at Apache and Nginx, they will start as root and then drop privileges for their forks children. So they're not running the actual web server process, uh, sorry, anything but the web server process, only the workers uh, are running as roots. That is not a nice pattern in containers, so what we can do here is remap ports from, uh, say, 8443. So we build a container, we would run it as non-root, have it bind to those very high ports, which don't require capped net bind admin, and then we use a service to essentially act as a shim uh, it's a translation layer. So the service re received requests from 443 because that's um, a command to the queue proxy, it's the API server, which is configuring the queue proxy, which is already running as root and has these network um, mutation privileges. But in the container, we can run as a non root user and uh, avoid a layer of insecurity that would result in the event of a, an RCE. Service accounts, spoken about these briefly. By default, they were mounted into all containers as. Uh, as privileged, and as such, should be audited and, um, yeah, just double checked, let's say. Oops, I've lost focus, excuse me. Uh, I love admission controllers. These things are awesome. This is, again, it's very simple. The way you get a pod into etcd, where it can then be looked at by the controller manager and the scheduler, is through the API server. Single point of entry for all that information and we authenticate and authorize our user. We mutate the resource itself, which might include something like adding a default service account or making sure that specific labels are, um, are added or maybe putting the time of the deployment actually is one of them. And then, then we validate the schema to make sure that we haven't balked anything in our mutation step. And then finally, we validate the admission controller. 
that, where, that is where, for example, the pod security policy comes in and says, well, you've tried to submit something which is running as a root user, or you've tried to break out of the network. You've, you've uh, set the Boolean to true for the network namespace with the host. I'm afraid I can't do that. And, uh, and you'll be denied at that stage. If all those pass, then we persist to etcd. Um, admission controllers are the root of the static analysis that Kubernetes does. We have a new extensible webhook admission controller, so we can put arbitrary functions on the end of those. They include things like Twistlock and Aqua, which will perform image vulnerability scanning from CVE feeds from repository package maintainers. And we submit the pod manifest to them. They validate whether the image that we've passed uh, is compliant by whatever we have configured in those systems, and then um, permit or deny that pod into the cluster. Super cool, loads of things that we can do in there. The webhooks are actually a bit difficult to write because they're very opinionated and require you to encode the public portion of the SAN, uh, sorry, of the, uh, the key that you're using uh, for your TLS exchange into the webhook manifest as you deploy it. Um, but I think super paranoid and it's a good thing. So, kubelet config. Uh, th these are, this is not kubelet config, these are more API server admission controllers. Um, Order really matters here. If you change the order, you will change what cascades from one to the other. They're run sequentially. There's lots of information here that I will not go into uh, in any depth due to the time, but uh, image policy, as, as I've spoken about, denying escalating execution means that if you're running a pod as privilege, you do not want a user to attach to it remotely because, of course, they have, uh, that is a privileged pod and you're essentially routing the hosts just with uh, uh, opening a WebSocket to that, uh, to that pod. Limit Ranger is the way that we permit namespaces to have a certain number of uh, resources. So it's C group based, CPU and memory allocation and resource accounting. Um, super useful to apply to namespaces, which namespaces are the, uh, the logical mapping for our applications. People use them in lots of different ways. Um, I've seen deployments where namespaces are around single, single scaling entities. I think that's a bit insane, frankly, and uh, prefer a logical grouping of similar concerns. Namespaces are also where we hang our network policies, which are um, cloud-native dynamic firewalls, essentially. And resource quota, it's the same as the previous. Uh, node restriction is super cool, but an example of how complex this whole um, cluster cluck is. This prevents pods from requesting secrets for, sorry, it prevents kubelets from requesting secrets for pods that they do not have running locally. So by uh, uh, induction, of course, we can, uh, we can see that a kubelet can request anything. It can request any secret. So access to a kubelet, which is an agent on a node, means that you can request secrets from the cluster. And those secrets, in a lot of cases, especially cryptograph jacking cases, contain AWS keys. They contain um, the, the root CAs for the cluster. They contain joining tokens for dynamic um, sc scaling systems like kubeADM. This is uh, very useful to, to run. These are the, uh, the default permissions that a, a node has. And as you can see, it can do a lot of things. Uh, and node restriction, finally, um, has to run in tandem with the, uh, the previous mission controller to actually have make any sense. I hope you're starting to understand why I'm such a strong advocate of uh, continuous assertions and pipeline-driven deployments and security for this stuff, because it is very um, broad, let's say. So uh, the pod security policy, as I said, it's also just an admission controller. It's static, anal static analysis on, the, on those pods. And one should absolutely always be running security policy, you can hang them on a namespace so you can run different levels for different workloads. Service accounts are mounted in by default, you may not want that, more information is available, and of course we have the validating admission webhooks, which means that we can apply our own arbitrary security gates to the hosted and managed Kubernetes distributions, which are generally pretty awesome. EKS is very new, so I would not apply the same um, awesomeness to it just yet. More stuff there about how to write these things. Okay, this is about encryption on etcd. You need to enable this experimental encryption provider config on the API server and then provide it a symmetric key in order for it to transparently encrypt 
the keys and values for what it's writing into etcd. Now, this means that um, ultimately without this, what goes into etcd is plain text. These also need rotating manually at this point in time. This only landed, what are we on, 2017, 08, recently. Before that, secrets, well, in fact, they still are, but before that, secrets were base64 encoded and pushed into etcd. So again, not a good story on security versus features, but of course the project has vindicated itself with uh, an insane level of adoption. Uh, plenty more stuff there, all good. Um, sealed secrets at the bottom is notable. That runs um, its own, it runs a pod inside a namespace, so you can use the key that you share with that sealed secrets instance to encrypt your secrets. You can write just the values encrypted into a GitOps repo, so maintaining this full, everything is code. When that hits the cluster, then the sealed secret is a special custom resource definition that is watched for by sealed secrets, decrypted in cluster and written back as an actual secret. So that ensures that we not only have secure transports of those secrets into the cluster, it means again that we don't have write access to the cluster, and it means that in case of um, disaster or uh, maliciousness, we can rebuild the entire application like that. Um, of course, depending on what it is, you may want to rotate your keys anyway. Token request API, again, super awesome. Um, basically, this is the problem with JOTS, as we know, is nonce rotation on every request. Otherwise, we are subject to replays. Token request is how not to be subject to replay attacks. And compliance scanning, there is lots of stuff here. If we want our clusters, again, to be, um, to, if you always want to know the state of these clusters, then Strongly recommend running these CIS benchmarks, as those of you that have run them are always very difficult to get 100% on, but uh, well worth it. And uh, yeah, lots of good stuff there. Image scanning, some of this is open source. Um, in fact, all of this is open source. The, the CLA integration is 100% recommended in order to use Claire, because Claire requires you to post each image of your, each layer of your Docker image to the HTTP server, hang around for a bit, Post the next one. So Clar just wraps that all up, super nice, um, and gives you uh, the same CVE vulnerability analysis feed um, is used as is used by the commercial products. Um, and the Docker Hub notably has deprecated its use of this. In fact, it's now removed. So at this stage, we want to secure some networking. This is broadly what the life of a packet looks like between two nodes. Um, my strongest recommendation, if you're thinking of running Kubernetes is to choose container network interface plugin that you are au fait with already because we have everything from uh, VLAN through uh, like pure ethernet, BGP implementations, we've got encapsulation at uh, layers four and seven, various other jiggery pokery and everything that we do is dependent upon the interpod communication. The deployment model of Kubernetes is flat. It's meant to mimic VMs and be easy to migrate VMs onto so all nodes, all pods, must be able to address all other pods on the network. The point here is it is complex. Um, but we have network policy to save us. You must be running one of the plugins that supports network policy in order to use network policy. Um, this is uh, less interesting than this, so I'm missing a slide. Uh, yeah, anyway, so um, WeaveNet, very strongly recommended, team in London who uh, built the original encrypted overlay for Docker. Um, they are now ultimately going to replace Lib Network as well, so that will be built into all Docker um, networking implementations and, uh, yeah, highly talented local team. Uh, some more stuff here. So this is a network policy. One of the poor decisions <laughs> that, that I slander them for, but of course uh, I don't necessarily know any better, is that this, is, this pod selector here, without a visible selector, is actually a wildcard. So that is a default um, fail closed policy, which I understand makes sense, but surely that should be an invalid resource format and you should get an error because I don't think that's very obvious. Anyway, so that is a default deny for every, um, every uh, pod network communication in the namespace. This is what you would then layer on top, which are exemptions for, in this case, 53 UDP and TCP. As you can see, again, we've got the pod selector with match labels. The only way that this is actually um, providing this, uh, these network exemptions is if those match labels are exactly correct on the deployments. Again, there's no validation here. If someone wants to build the tool to analyze and tell you where you've got matches for um, labels that you do not have, 
I would deploy it, if you don't mind. So, of course, in this case, we've got a fail safe because we've denied all egress in the namespace anyway, and we're not reliant on that particular pod selector to keep us safe. That actually enables networking and uh, connectivity. DNS is a non-deterministic resolution, so uh, there is no DNS in network policies. That is illegal. Um, of course, that could be because we've got GOIPs or round robin load balancing or whatever that is. Uh, so that's all very nice. Can we do any better? Of course we can. 2018 is the year of the service mesh. I'm sure you've heard of Istio and various other flavors. Everybody is deploying something or in this ecosystem are working towards it. Um, it's really awesome. Uh, come along to Istio London if you want to learn more. But suffice to say, it is still on its way to a 1.0 release. Uh, there have been issues with the Envoy integration. They've taken the V1 API, which would poll the central infrastructure. At a certain scale, that would take down the Istio infrastructure that's all self-hosted in the same Kubernetes cluster. So they changed that API from V1 REST to V2 gRPC. Much nicer, no longer battle testers. And uh, yes, there is work to do, and all contributions, of course, are welcome. Um, I don't have a lot of time, but these are here for posterity. The service mesh is ultimately an encrypted web of HTTP2 connections. In Envoy's case, we have mutual TLS on all of those individually because we've got Spiffy, that mutual TLS is actually the workload identity. So compromise of a single pod only affects the communication from that pod to the thing it's allowed to talk to. We also have RBAC in Kubernetes. We have granular HTTP verbiage RBAC as well. So we can overlay Istio onto an existing system. It also extends nicely onto VMs. I feel like I'm pitching for it. It's great, but of course, uh, baby steps, gently, gently. Um, that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, really good workshop from Christian Poster, Red Hat Guru there. And, uh, and yeah, this is what Istio gives you. The, the moon on a stick, more or less. Um, really excited about the deployment strategies. These enable dark traffic routing, or like dark canaries, um, <laughs> as I like to say. And uh, yes, there's all sorts there. This is a root rule for Istio, and it's actually performing routing based upon the regex of the cookie header. Why can it do that? Because in this model, Envoy is terminating the TLS. A Kubernetes pod is a singular network namespace. So Envoy is able to fire up IP tables, all Kubernetes networking's IP tables, for which I apologize. Fire up IP tables, redirect all traffic back to uh, port 1337. And uh, as a result, all outbound and inbound communication to the downstream service here is proxied by Envoy. Again, no exceptions. Envoy is also the place that takes the workload identity, requests the certificate, and so terminates the TLS. So it's able to see these requests in plain text while maintaining security because it's essentially running as a sidecar. Uh, so that's how we get the plain text cookie header there and we're able to route on it. We've written more tooling because this again was very difficult to deploy. Uh, so Netsa is aggressively parallelized Nmap with some namespace invasion and remote access capability that you basically describe what you think your network topology should look like. And uh, this is the, the Kubernetes version, so it's um, plain old instance in Kubernetes aware. And what it will do is SSH onto the node that is running one of these pods. It will attach to the same network namespace, which means that outbound requests appear to be coming from the same network adapter as the existing pod. And then it will run Nmap in uh, the most aggressively parallelized way that the, um, the host will manage. It can also run slightly differently where it uses the labels of the services, but of course, we're then subjecting ourselves to possible bugs there. And by spinning up a pod in a cluster, we're also impacting what Kubernetes sees. So this is a transparent way of testing things um, without impacting the Kubernetes uh, deployment. Nice tap output, lots of interesting stuff there. Okay, let's recap, because we don't have very much time left. For securing our hosts, we've spoken about these minimal API, uh, minimal operating systems. Of course, we want our SecComp, AppArmor, SE Linux, et cetera, enabled. And immutable infrastructure just prevents configuration drift. Containers are running immutably, and you could even prevent, um, you can run them with an immutable file system flag so that they don't, they don't write to anywhere apart from maybe um, temp. Why not extend that to the infrastructure? We're already there, um, super useful. And of course, grouping nodes by type is really useful as well. We don't want network access to anything at all from our pods. This is such a common source of escalation. 
as is, of course, the cloud provider metadata API. It's, uh, the, the attack service, unfortunately, again, is, is wide and broad because of the way this thing's been developed. There are ways to proxy to the metadata API. It's a solved problem. Make sure you're running something like this. Oh, we're missing a picture of kittens. Devastating. All right, well, ah, oh, thank you. This is, this is what I think Kubernetes actually is. Bless them all. Okay, soft multi-tenancy. We want to isolate things by namespace. Default network policy and pod security policies on those namespaces. Limits. And net, I mean, despite the promise of running this heavily multi-tenanted infrastructure, do not run similar concerns, uh, th sorry, different concerns like dev and production on the same things. Scan everything, run policy. We've been through a lot of this. Hard multi-tenancy. Uh, only co-tenant along your existing security boundaries. This is not a panacea. There's no magic bullet here. Uh, we really must separate things in the way that we would traditionally. We can annotate our nodes with labels we have advanced scheduling features, such as pod anti-affinity that prevents things from being co-deployed. And uh, we can also, once we've done all that, run a layer of analysis on our running workloads to make sure that we're never actually crossing these boundaries. Ultimately, if your security concerns are high enough, run multiple clusters. There is no other way of saying it. There are lots of container runtimes. We've spoken about some of these. The virtual kubelet is so cool. It basically acts as a shim to any other system. So um, you, could put, uh, you could put a mainframe behind a kubelet and have Kubernetes addressing that mainframe and scheduling things on it um, via, via Kubernetes itself. Yeah, so uh, hard multi-tenancy with a shared control plane, that is the compromise that one is making. I'm still whizzing through to the end of these. Good stuff from our friend Dan Walsh. Um, and of course, intrusion detection. Uh, is important because despite all these layers of, uh, of defense, defense in depth is the mantra that we always uh, repeat to ourselves. Lots of useful stuff here. The auto-generating of RBAC from audit exemptions is super cool. Um, we get audit logs from GKE, so everything, everything is audited. They use various different levels of uh, um, request logging, so you would never log the request body of a secret post or a secret get, for example. Um, that is what audit to our back looks like, but I won't go into any detail. Loads of stuff about privileged container builds. When you build a container, you're doing it as root. Um, Alexis Sarai, who is a genius from Australia, has shipped loads of features into Run C and, uh, and Golang and the kernel to get rootless container builds closer to reality. Um, Lord Cypher, well recommended to follow. And of course, there's no point doing this unless we continually assert it, not only in the pipeline, but also at runtime. Uh, thank you for the, the cat metaphor, internet. Uh, yes, so the system continually self-validates, we become more robust, and uh, the advanced penetration testers are not left with uh, automated scanning, grabbable fruit. So, don't get caught out. Be proactive and preempt what is coming. <laughs> There we go, the brave new world of Kubernetes gives us so much, but it also dramatically increases the attack surface. There are lots of interesting new and varied ways to defend things, but ultimately we need oversight and centralized control from pipelines. Yeah, security testing keeps you young, I'm sure you're all aware. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I really liked your talk, Thanks. and I feel that you had the exact right amount of cat memes. That was very good. And I would like to know when your slides will be available <laughs> so that very I could question. do every single thing in them. Uh, let's see. Um, so I will publish them on Twitter where they will probably get picked up by. Uh... Did you the app yes. Yeah. And then I <laughs> Indeed it is. Yeah, no problem. Hi. Hi, I have two questions. Uh, many of the security concerns you mentioned it during your presentation. Can, can you shout a bit? Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, so many of the security concerns you mentioned in your presentation is already addressed in the OpenShift. So why not, I mean, if somebody's worried about security, 
and the multi-tenancy cluster. Why not use the OpenShift cluster and the go I, for it? OpenShift is great, yeah. It's very opinionated. Um, the only reason not to use OpenShift, frankly, is vendor lock-in. Apart from that, that, I mean, it's... I mean, end of the yeah. day, OpenShift origin is open source. I mean, you don't need to worry yeah. about yeah, vendor lock-in. Uh, but, but of course, enterprises demand, uh, um, uh, they demand the heads to roll when something breaks, frankly, and they require that enterprise support licensing. Uh, but OpenShift actually contributes loads of security features back to Kubernetes, like RBAC and various other things. Um, so OpenShift is awesome, basically. One more question. So you mentioned core OS group in like uh, one slide, like third or fourth. So why is that core OS group? Uh, four eyes. Core OS. Core OS. Yeah. Yeah, core OS is now obviously the Red Hat team. Uh, Red Hat bought core OS. Um, they are folding Tectonic into uh, the, uh, the Red Hat, uh, the OpenShift application itself, which is super cool. And they're also folding the CoreOS container Linux into Fedora and taking, excuse me, the, the Omaha uh, update mechanism, which they got from Chrome OS, which is actually built on Gen 2, whole layer in direction there. Um, it's awesome. Yeah, um, it's been forked by Kimvolk, so we can run Flatcar Linux, which is the